But tonight I want to conclude what I have to say to you about process and outcome. Open your Bibles up to Proverbs 22:28. In seeking to understand God's process leading to outcome, we can observe that this is not unfamiliar territory. You may hear some things that have been said in this meeting and think, yeah, that sounds good, but I've never experienced it. But let me tell you something. Cha-ching! Donation. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> We are not treading upon ground that has not been covered successfully by previous people, groups, and generations in the church. Along that line, I want to make some observations from the past that you and I can learn from. Now, there are many notable voices in the church that are saying now, well-known prophetic voices that are saying that it is fruitless and not productive to look to past outpourings and past revivals for any kind of a metric for what God is doing now. And I understand what they're saying. We can't get captivated in looking back. But the scripture says in Proverbs 22, 28, remove not the ancient landmark. And there are some ancient landmarks for years, for decades. I gave up my vacation time and my holidays because I worked so hard, I had no time, even as a pastor, I had no time to go and inquire of the scriptures or when I was working in business to go inquire of the scriptures and study what I personally wanted to study because I was too busy getting it for other people. Because what a pastor, you know, a pastor cannot feed you off of his plate. He has to eat what God gives him, but he has to feed you what God tells him to. It's like a little baby, you don't give him a, a New York strip. Right. And, uh, and so I gave up my, my holidays and my vacation for decades to shut myself away and study revivals and outpourings of God's Spirit for the last 500 years. And as I studied them, God showed me how to internalize them until they became a manifestation in my life. And, uh, and so I knew something. Don't remove the ancient landmark. In fact... Deuteronomy 27, 17 says there's actually a curse on you if you do that. Don't remove, don't forget what previous generations have done. We don't have to reinvent the wheel. We can follow the pattern of what others have done. And God's no respecter of persons, but he is a respecter of faith. He's the same yesterday, today, and forever. He's no respecter of persons, but he is a respecter of faith. If you do with your faith what they did with their faith, you will get the same, if not better, results. Let me say that again. If you do with your faith what others have done with their faith, you will get the same, if not better, results. The fact of the matter is that previous generations of believers have more, much more successfully demonstrated the testimony of Christ even in our lifetime. Compared to the relative anemic witness of the church today, that the church is what? You know, there was a time that the world trembled before the church. There was a time that we weren't trying to make converts, we were discipling nations. Nations trembled before the house of God. Today, we're pretty much ignored wholesale, even in the United States. Who would have ever thought in our lifetime we'd be where we are today in society and in government? All we need to do is get a Republican in, right? Yeah, right. That's all I'm going to say about politics in this conference. The charismatic movement of the 1960s and 70s reshaped, now think about it. Now, many of us here lived through that. It reshaped Christianity as we know it, and it established a testimony that completely shifted the understanding of the church and the world about experiential Christianity and fullness of the Spirit that proposed that God was and was willing to become personally involved in the affairs of men in a unique and an intimate way that was 
before that time not considered to be something that that was uh, over the, the other side of the tracks religion. I've just been in this long enough to remember when what you and I take for granted in our belief system was other side of the tracks religion That's right. and considered yeah. not something that any <coughs> decent uh, intelligent person would want to get involved in. Yeah. Yeah. <coughs> And then the Holy Spirit was poured out. And when the Holy Spirit was poured out, everybody bailed out of the nominal churches. And we had government officials and school officials and important people in the country club and in the golf clubs and the tennis clubs coming to cottage prayer meetings with their miniature reel-to-reel -reel tape players and under their arm, a family Bible, a martini, and a cigarette and making their way in and stepping into that prayer meeting and the glory would fall. <laughs> and all the Pentecostals kind of went till. Uh, but the charismatic movement, it changed. It changed Christianity as we know it. Before that, the decade of the 50s captivated the world by hearing evangelists such as William Branham a. A. Allen, Jack Coe, Earl Roberts, and many others. Their testimony reached the world with demonstrations of signs, miracles, and wonders that were often repudiated but could not be ignored to the point that the only way they could deal with them was to criminalize their behavior and put them in jail. So those of you that know the history know that's true. Then before that, the holiness revivals of the late 1890s under men and women like John Alexander Dowie, who was driven to build community, actually built Zion, Illinois. Yeah. That's right. And Maria Woodworth Edder. Maria Woodworth Edder, she wrote a journal, how she supported her ministry. She would write a journal throughout the year. And then she would publish that journal and people would support her ministry. And her meetings were so large and so moving that it got to the point she could not meet in buildings. She's the only modern minister I know of, other than William Branham, that like Jesus, she had to go out into the open places because there was no venue, no community, no city that could hold the meetings and the people that were flocking to her ministry. And she would come in from the meetings and she would write late in the night. She would write in her journal and she would say, The slain of the Lord were many. Yeah. And it was unique in that people, old people, people in their 70s, 80s, and 90s <laughs> that had never professed Christ were giving their life to Jesus. And the tremendous impact that they had that set the stage for the Topeka outpouring under Charles Parham and the subsequent Azusa Street Revival. Their influence and impact on Christianity as we know it, you can't overestimate it. The debt that we owe to people like Maria Woodworth Edder and Charles Parham and John Alexander Dowie. And before that, it was the Welsh Revival under Evan Roberts, which is a singular example in our time of a nation-transforming revival. During this outpouring, sports teams disbanded because they would rather participate in what God was doing rather than fill sports stadiums for their sporting events. Wow, that's good. Hello. Jails emptied out because there was no crime. Court dockets were empty because everyone was forgiving one another and didn't want to take each other to court. It was a mining nation. And so they worked at that time. They had to have uh, ponies, pit ponies, to pull the ore out of the mines. And the pit ponies, the owners of the mines, had to get rid of all the pit ponies because the miners got born again and quit cursing the pit ponies and the pit ponies didn't know what to do with born again, kind, sweet, loving masters. <laughs> Police stations, instead of going out to deal with crime, they sent out quartets to sing in gospel meetings because there was no crime to go out and investigate. Hallelujah. The Welsh revival was unique. Now listen to me. 
The Welsh revival was unique in that it was not born in the religious infrastructure of the institutional church. The Welsh revival began with families who worked 12 and 18 hours a day, coming home and gathering their children and their loved ones nightly to pray and to seek God. This turned into home-based meetings that grew so large that church buildings were resorted to only out of necessity of finding venues large enough to contain the people who came seeking more of God. I love Evan Roberts. He would pray. He would say, bend us, O God. Bend us to thy will and save the world. Jesus. Then there was the Cambridge Revival. Another one of my personal favorites. The jerking exercise and the dancing exercise and the barking exercise and the dancing exercise and the rowing exercise and all the people in their finery and their sophistication and they were so offensive to these staid, uh, formalized people who would say this can't possibly be God but then the people would get up out of this state of excitation and begin to prophesy the glories of God and their heart, the hardest hearts would be melted and their scorn would evaporate and they'd fall on their face and give their life to Jesus. Thank you, Father. The Cambridge Revival gave birth to the idea of camp meetings. It was born in colonial Kentucky under men like George Whitfield and Peter Cartwright. And this movement came about in response to a level of anarchy. Have you been watching the news? No. Do you understand how many remember the 60s? Oh, yeah. Hello? Is what you've been seeing on the news remind you of that? Yeah. Do you understand it's, it's not going to diminish? That the, subs the election season subsiding is not going to put an end to what we're seeing <laughs> taking place. And this was what was going on in colonial Kentucky when uh, lawless people and criminals and hooligans got together and tried to establish in the Appalachians a Barbary Coast style nation in defiance of the westward advance, expansion of the United States. And the God-fearing people who felt vulnerable and afraid gathered together and began to see God. And you can, you can look at their churches today that are left and you'll go into the church and there's two muskets, one on each side of the pulpit. And the men sat in the, in the pews with their muskets cocked and loaded because of the danger that was comprised by serving God and standing up for God in that time. God-fearing people who felt powerless and vulnerable, hello, began to pray and seek God. And the signs, miracles, and wonders that began to occur in these very large meetings changed the face of America and prepared America with something called a camp meeting to be prepared for the revivals that swept the encampments of northern and southern armies during the Civil War when brother was turning against brother and the Holy Ghost fell on both sides of the Mason-Dixon and brought revival into the nation. Out of the Cambridge Revival came the ministry of a man by the name of Charles Finney, who single-handedly now, single-handedly became a one-man move of God that gave birth to the holiness movement from which Pentecostalism sprang. Finney was so bold and so powerful that backslidden preachers and cold-hearted churches threatened to oppose him with cannon fire if he dared to come into their cities. Because he would come into the city and the city would grind to a halt. Business would stop. Nobody could do anything. They would come running out of their homes and fall at Finney's feet, begging him to come in and pray for those that were in their homes stricken with conviction over their sins just because he walked into town. And he had a retired Episcopalian priest called Father Nash that would go in a year ahead of time and he would rent. And one time he rented a basement with a dirt floor and he locked the door and laid there wailing in intercession for one year. 
And the landlady thinks the guy's dead, insane, and is telegraphing to Finney and saying, you know, something's wrong here. He said, leave him alone. He's interceding. And through that intercession, Finney's ministry, the conviction with which he preached, he preached, he was like, how I many know who William Wilberforce is? He was the Englishman. It was a big part of, of uh, ending slavery in Europe and in England. And the conviction with, Finney, with which Finney preached is said by many to have awakened the conscience of the nation to put an end to slavery even at the cost of civil war. We could have a whole conversation about that. In the 1720s before this, there was a band of refugees, we mentioned it, from Moravia, settled in Germany. It was interesting, the Moravians, their spiritual father, their patriarch, was a man by the name of John Huss. And his name means goose. And when he was put on trial and, and uh, threatened to recant on pain of torture, he signed a recantation. And then he repented and he said, I refuse to recant. And when they took him to the stake, to burn him at the stake, he begged indulgence of the executioner and he walked over and he took the hand by which he recanted his faith and he held it in the fire to punish the offending member. And when they put him on the stake and they put the torch to the wood, he began to prophesy. Now remember, his name means goose. He said, in a hundred years, there's going to be a goose that's going to come forth that you'll not be able to burn and that you'll not be able to bake. And a hundred years later, Martin Luther came out and nailed his 99 theses to the door of the Wittenberg Chapel. And you and I know what happened next. And out of that, the Moravians were hounded out of their country. And they settled in the, on the estate of a German nobleman by the name of Ludwig von Zinzendorf. Yeah. He had a monocle. <laughs> they struggled through a bitter winter, arguing and bickering, until in desperation they began to hold prayer meetings just to seek the peace of God, not to kill each other. Yeah. And out of these prayer meetings of desperation emerged a 100-year, 24-7 prayer vigil. And as they pursued the heart of God, this small village of refugees, illegal immigrants, launched a missions effort unparalleled in history. In the decade following, these few believers at Hernhut, the village of Hernhut, sent out more missionaries in 10 years than all of Christianity had, numbering all the way back to the first century church. As I said last night, two of their numbers, young men, sold themselves into slavery because they didn't have the money to buy passage to the East Indies. And they stood on in the bow of the boat as it left their weeping relatives and they said, may the Lamb receive the reward of His suffering. And that became the motto of their ministry. Years later, after Charles Wesley was almost eaten by cannibals in Georgia, sometimes I wonder if Georgia is still a dangerous place to be. Hello. <laughs> He was making passage with his brother back to England and the, there was a storm so horrific that uh, experienced sailors were vomiting out of fear, terrified that they were all about to lose their life and out on the decks of the ship around terrified experienced sailors, here was a band of Moravians just standing sweetly in the Spirit of God and singing hymns and thanks unto God. And John Wesley was galvanized by that. And he said, when will this religion cover the earth as the waters cover the sea? And he founded Methodism. And the, in, in England they said, you don't want to have Methodists. Uh, working in your household unless you want your entire family to become Methodists. Because they were leakers. Hello. <laughs> and then harking back to the early church, we find in the earliest days of the church after the resurrection of Jesus, A small Jewish sect led by a group of ex-cons. Every one of their leaders had been in prison. 
who proclaimed that their leader, an executed criminal, was the Messiah of the Hebrews and in fact God of all the earth. Yes, he was. Can you imagine? Yes, he is. The times the early Christians lived in were brutal. Tiberius Caesar, who was emperor during the early days of the church and during Jesus' lifetime. Now listen to me. We whine so much. We are so easy. We are so easily manipulated. Tiberius Caesar was known to gather to his palace nightly children and young people, street urchins, for nightly sexual exploitation. And when he finished with them in his debauchery, we're talking about the emperor of the, of the world, the government that they were a part of, that they served under, that after his debauchery, when he had abused these children, he would have his guards throw them off a thousand foot cliff at the back of his palace grounds. And for all of this, what would you do if this was taking place at the White House? For all of this, the church was not an activist church. The church was not insurgent in nature. Yet they set an example, listen to me, of an obscure misunderstood sect of miscreants who in three generations by how they prayed and how they died brought the might of Rome to its knees at the foot of the cross. Roman procurators over and over again sent letters to Rome saying we got to quit killing these Christians for every one we kill a hundred spring up in their place because they die so well. It was common for when they would cruci crucify or execute or feed a Christian to the lions that people who came to enjoy the spectacle would come running out of the stands and join them and give their lives to Jesus. The early church understood something about process and outcome. The scripture tells us that the record they left is not only for the purposes of history, but as an example to us. Paul told Timothy in 2 Timothy 3, 7, he said that the scripture is given by God and is profitable that we might be thoroughly furnished, that we might be perfect and thoroughly furnished into every good works. That means that what they did, because it's in the sacred record, is an example to you and I. Well, let's find out what they did. Let's get past the poetry and find out what they did and see how that should change what's being implemented in our life. I've heard denominational leaders arrogantly remark with a straight face that the early church was the church in its infancy, but we in our generation, we're the mature church. <laughs> Having put away the childishness events by the Christians who died in the Colosseums for their faith. My response is in agreement with the words of Jesus in Mark 10, 15. He said, Verily I say unto you, Whosoever shall not receive the kingdom of God as a little child, he's not going to enter therein. We can learn from the early church. Like Paul, God told Moses, See that you build according to the pattern. There's a pattern revealed to us that is personal. It's not institutional. If you try and make it institutional, it fails. That's been done. It's a whole lot more, folks, than we just try to figure out how to bring God in the house. Well, maybe if we just put the chairs in a circle, that'll bring revival. Maybe if we do this, maybe if we do that. Let's come out of the denominations. Denominationalism is Babylon. So we came out of Babylon, but there was Babylon in us. And the non-denominational churches have more of Babylon in them than the denominational churches ever thought of. Institutional, we're trying to put impose upon the institutions of Christianity, our personal responsibility will get us nowhere. And recent history in the last 50 years ought to teach us that. Jesus. We can learn from the early church. The world we live in is not nearly as debauched and corrupt as the world that the early Christians came to faith in. This was a generation, listen, this was a generation that conquered Rome. Not a representative democracy, by the way. That conquered Rome with people with no redress. 
of people so much on the fringe of society that they met in the catacombs and the tombs. Come on. But yet a people by how they prayed and how they died, they brought a, the world power, Rome, to its knees at the foot of the cross. The early church, they gave themselves over to an apostolic culture that was typified by very simple, now I'm after you, by very simple and reproducible lifestyle choices that were personal and not institutional. Mm -hmm. Jesus. That you can replicate in your life from this day forward. What is apostolic culture? Acts chapter 2, verse 42. It says, They continued steadfastly, number one, in the apostles' doctrine and fellowship. Number two. Number three, in breaking of bread, covenantal relationship. Number four, and in prayers. I mean, if we're going to follow apostles' doctrine and we're going to begin to have genuine fellowship and walk in covenantal relationship, you better believe it. Somebody pray. The next thing is prayer. And fear came upon every soul. And many signs and wonders were done by the apostles. And they continued daily with one accord in the temple, breaking bread from house to house, did eat their meat with singleness and gladness of heart. They had been in a 600-year tradition of meeting in synagogues. The synagogue system of Nehemiah and Ezra's day is almost um, completely recognizable compared to Christianity as we know it. There's very little distinction between the synagogue system that Ezra and Nehemiah established and how Christianity gets done. But it's interesting that they had 600 years of religious tradition that said you meet in a synagogue and you get a building and you gather people and you have a, a committee and you have these things and the early church didn't do that. Why didn't they do that? There's something they knew, something they understood. And again, I'm not talking about the outward appearance. I'm talking about the life of God that was in them provoked them to understand that the mandates and the claims of Christ were a matter of personal responsibility that could not be scheduled with the schedule of services and handing out a flyer when you come into the church. Amen. And they went from house to house and did eat their meat with singleness and gladness of heart, praising God and having favor with all the people. And then, here's, that's the process, here's the outcome. And the Lord added to the church daily such as should be saved. Yeah. We look at that, yes, the Lord, the massive crowds of people, everybody's coming to, everybody, the whole city's come to the door. Now that's outcome. The process was what they did before that. That's it. You cannot control the outcome. You cannot make the outcome manifest. But you can commit yourself to the process. You can commit yourself to apostolic culture. And that's what I'm provoking in you tonight. We take a look at the statement in the last passage and identify it as what revival looks like. That, however, is just the tipping point of outcome that a particular movement came to through a process that was committed to, maintained, and endured. Endured. Hello, have you ever had to endure your fellow Christians? Your brothers and sisters in Christ? Hello, I'm going to love you. Teeth grit and love. I'm going to love you if it kills me and you both. <laughs> because they wanted to have something. They had, listen, they had accepted the overture of heaven to have something different beyond the status quo of the prevailing religious system of their day. How many are sick and tired of being sick and tired? Yes. Yes. How many are ready for something more than the status quo? Yes. Yes. Examining the pattern followed by the first century believers, we see they did some things. Number one, they continued in the apostles' doctrine. Man, I have just barely got people to engage in a dialogue over who's the prophet in your life. <laughs> who's the apostle in your life? Why does it matter? Who cares? Why does it matter? 1 Corinthians 12, 28 says, God has set some in the church, first apostles, secondarily prophets, thirdly teachers. Who's the apostle in your life? Who's the prophet in your life? Who's the teacher in your life? 
Why does it matter? It's because of what happens next. And after that, miracles, gifts of healings. Where's all the miracles? Well, who's the apostle in your life? Didn't know I needed one. Not interested in having one. Who's the prophet in your life? Didn't know I needed one. Not interested in having one. Who's the teacher in your life? I went to Sunday school when I was a kid. I don't want to do that anymore. <laughs> Opting into a process. First apostles, secondarily prophets, thirdly teachers. After that, Come on. miracles, gifts of healing, helps, governments. One of the governments that got added after that was the government of Rome that bowed its knee at the foot of the cross. Folks, it's not going to come in the vote voting booth. It's going to come as we opt into an apostolic culture. Amen. That's right. And then the miracles, and then the healings, and then God says, "Oh, by the way, would you like to have the governments of the world?" Yes. Amen. I'll, I'll add, then I'm going to add the governments. Right. Your government, the government of this nation, the government of that nation. Why? Because as it was in the, under the tyranny of Rome, God will take the representative democracies of the earth, which the Western world has to contend with, and He will compel them to bow their knees at the foot of the cross to a people who have opted in, not to an institutional value and the surrogacy of a corrupt clergy, but they've opted in to a protocol of apostolic culture, and they're going to give their lives to it until it produces what God promised. Yes, God. I'm after you. Amen. See, the ministry of the pastor is only one part of the full spectrum of ministry God wants to install in your life. The ministry of the prophet is not an end in itself. The prophet, as in John the Baptist's example, is the forerunner of the emerging apostles in every generation they serve. Why do you think we have two apostles? Two unimpeachable apostles. Hallelujah. Two apostles that have the sign and the validity of authenticity in their ministry and in their track record here tonight. As John said in John 3.30, he said, I must decrease that he must increase. I believe it's highly possible that John the Baptist was God's first choice for the ministry that eventually fell to Paul. <coughs> But he had a problem. He said, are you he that should come or am I looking for another? He said, Jesus is going to come. He's going to burn up the chaff with unquenchable fire. And Jesus came kissing babies and drinking wine. And John was scandalized. God never told John to tell Herod he couldn't have his brother's wife. We're trying to confront government on their own terms. We took things that were sacred like marriage. Things that were sacred, such as gender identity, and we made them a matter of litigation in the courts of man. And the devil said, I was waiting on you to do that. And he plowed us under because we believe the lies that the politicians told us. It's just give me four more years. Just four more years. It's the Democrats' fault. Just give me four year, more years. I'll solve the problem. And we stand today in total failure of the political process. Because we chose political process over apostolic culture. Come on now. In the next 10 years, the question of who is the apostle in your life is going to be answered by those who decide to move on from the status quo of weak, anemic religious culture that grips the church today. Stick with me. Here's the commitment I'm calling you to. See, I've got to give you something to do. Because the kingdom doesn't come by observation. I'm calling you to make a commitment today. From this day forward to pray into and inquire into apostolic ministry and culture. To determine to find out what it is to become accountable and walk in accountability to someone besides yourself. That begins, first of all, by being accountable, by holding yourself accountable to yourself. You have to realize that accountability exists before you can find an apostle to be accountable to. And if you're not holding yourself accountable, then to go up to 
an apostle and say, I think you're my spiritual father, is just an absolute hypocrisy. If I want to know who's going to be launching out of relationship with us, it's the person who comes up and precipitously, without counting the cost, says, you're my spiritual dad. I give him two weeks. That question is going to be answered by those who decide to move on and walk in accountability to someone beyond yourself in a wholesome, transformative, and positive way. Being willing to identify false apostles who are in name only, immature, not demonstrating biblical signs of apostleship. Jesus. That was the first part of apostolic culture. The second part is fellowship. Amen. There's a difference between fellowship and relationship. Fellowship is fraternal, supportive, affirming, What's the big problem? Both the church and the world agree that the biggest problem Christians have is they're too judgmental. They don't have fraternity. If you, if you want to be affirmed, go down to the bar. <laughs> because you're going to get more affirmation at the bar than you will in most churches in America. You know, when they go to the bar, they're not going to sit there and look at the back of each other's heads for 45 minutes. <laughs> They're there to engage with one another. I'm not advocating. <laughs> My daddy said, if you see me coming out of a bar, don't think nothing of me unless I'm standing. <laughs> Fellowship is a fraternal, supportive, affirming engagement of your brothers and sisters in Christ. It must come. You must have fellowship before relationship can be genuine and authentic. Listen to me. Who's the authority in your life? Well, my pastor is my cover. I submit to my pastor. Let me tell you something. Authority in Christ does not extend beyond relationship and fellowship. If your pastor doesn't know when your mouthwash ain't making it, you can claim this he's your covering all you want. But there's something on there. Hello. So I want you to make a commitment. Find out who's the apostle in your life, number one. Number two, from this day forward, step out of your comfort zone and refuse to languish in the ideation of Christian communion as being somewhere where we go for 45 minutes and look at the back of somebody's head. <laughs> Make proof of your connectivity in Christ with other believers by having them in your home. This weekend, I want you to invite somebody into your home that you barely know, but you know they're a brother in Christ and you need to spend time with them. I challenge you. I'm, I'm confronting you if that's what it has to be. Who's the apostle in your life? Are you willing to step into a culture of fostering fellowship? Having other believers in your home, enjoying meals with them, find out who their children are, what their heart's cry is, making other believers on a weekly basis, meeting with them in an intimate and authentic manner. Do not let 48 hours go before you do something about this. Number three, we have fellowship, then we move to relationship. What's the difference between fellowship and relationship? The difference between fellowship and relationship, one of my mentors said, is I'm ready to hold hands, but I'm not ready to kiss. Mm -hmm. right. Moving into relationship. Here's the difference between fellowship and relationship. Fellowship is based on commonality in Christ. We've got something in com common. We share meals. We have a movie night. We enjoy a sports event together. We hang out. Relationship, breaking of bread. Remember, breaking of bread? That's covenantal. The primary difference between fellowship and relationship is that those you're in relationship with have an open invitation to speak formatively in your life. Who is there besides a church official or someone called to fivefold ministry that speaks formatively in your life? That can talk to you about the most intimate things in your life and you're open to hear what they have to say because you have a covenant of relationship with them and you want something between you and other brothers and sisters in Christ that's authentic and real. Moving in relationship. 
make a commitment. Do not let 48 hours go by until you reach out to someone in proximity to your life and make a concerted effort to establish engagement with that person or with that couple other than an ecclesiastical leader of your church. Make a decision to fellowship their liabilities as well as their assets. You know, when you're going in the dark and everything's coming up roses, you got lots of friends. And your life falls apart like a $2 watch. And, you know, they got, they got caller ID. <laughs> Be willing to take the heat for those you are in relationship with and not distance yourself for your own protection and convenience. You know what one of the major demons that is getting over on the church today? That's not convenient for me. That's his name. That's not convenient for me. I'll pass. I think I'll just coast. This is the calling, listen to me. To have people in your life that you look at and you say, I will never leave you, I will never forsake you. That's the gold standard of the love of God being made manifest in your life. Prayers. Now we better pray. If we're going to find out who our apostle is, Lord help us. And we're going to start fellowshipping with some folks we haven't been fellowshipping with. And we're going to have an overture of authentic relationship. Somebody pray. <laughs> William Seymour, though, I'm almost done. The father of the Azusa Street outpouring contacted Evan Roberts before the Azusa Street outpouring came. And here's what Evan Roberts said in his telegraph. He wanted to know, what do I do? Seymour wanted to know, what do I do? He said, Evan Roberts told him, congregate the people, gather the people who are willing to make a total sur surrender and pray. I don't think you would be here in this meeting if you were not willing to make a total surrender to the Lord Jesus Christ, even if it inconveniences your lifestyle. Even if you have to opt out of the culture of institutional religion and seek out something as inconvenient as apostolic culture as it's defined in Acts chapter 2. Willing to be inconvenienced. Gather the people who are willing to make a total surrender. Pray and wait. Believe God's promises. Hold daily meetings. Here's our commitment to prayer. Community is the most basic commitment and covenant of God's process that leads to outcome. Reach out today to someone and suggest that you connect with them regularly, at least weekly, for prayer. For prayer. You remember prayer? <laughs> In person, over the phone, via the internet, whatever it takes. The Welsh revival that changed a nation was birthed in an ad hoc grassroots prayer initiative. Quit talking about prayer and start praying. The Lord told me one time, I have a real problem with pretense in prayer. O oh, most merciful Heavenly Father, I come humbly to Thee, that Thou wouldst look down on this mortal coil, and that You would deign in Thy beneficence to make Thy beneficent self and reveal to me in a genuine way. <laughs> So I struggle with prayer. And the Lord said, let me help you. He said, I'm resurrected. I'm sinless. I'm at the right hand of the Father. And if I have to pray, you have to pray. What's he doing? What's he doing? He's praying. He's praying right now. He's praying. He's praying for you. And he's praying for me. If he has to pray, we have to pray. The Welsh Revival was birthed in a prayer initiative. Quit talking about prayer and start praying. The early church believers greeted one another with a provocation. Do I meet you praying? Do I find, can you imagine picking up the phone? Do I find you praying? Wow. Do I find you praying? Wow. Make it your determination. Now here, let me help you. I'm calling you. I'm challenging you. Come on. I'm challenging you with a commitment. Let me make it easy. You don't step foot outside of your bedroom until you have made verbal prayer to God. Jesus. I don't have time for that. I don't care. The time it takes you to walk out of your bedroom. That you will not step out of your bed. Why verbal? Because prayer is not verbal. It's not prayer. It's wishful thinking. 
Make it your determination that you're not going to walk out of your bedroom without verbal prayer. Come on. And that you're going to connect with someone over the internet, texting, I don't care how you do it, email, Facebook, that you're going to connect with somebody and say, I need a prayer partner. Would you be my prayer partner? And begin to pray. What's the outcome? Jesus declared in the Gospel of Matthew that he was building something called an ecclesia. Do you know what an ecclesia was? It was actually a secular term. It was not a religious term. It was a 6,000 member military body that would get together under the Greek city-states and they'd decide we need to go invade this country. How many know we need to have an invasion? And they would get 6,000 soldiers together who had at least two years military experience. And those 6,000 soldiers would elect somebody to be their leader and they called him an apostolos. That's right. And they would take that apostolos and formulate a battle plan and then they would spend their own money to build a fleet of ships that then they would get on and go with the apostolos and invade the foreign country. Right. Amen. And Jesus said, and the Romans adopted that because when the Romans came to Jerusalem, they sent a military commander who was actually a general and an ambassador, and he was called an apostolos. And the Roman apostolos would come to invade as he did Jerusalem, and they would come to the city leaders or to the nation's leaders, and they would make the case preaching a gospel. They would make the case for the people to join the Roman Empire without a fight. But then if they wanted to resist, the Roman ambassador would show his, his rank and he'd remind them, I have an army just out there in the harbor and you either agree to this or we're going to come in here and absolutely dominate you by force. My, my. And when, so when, you know what they called those? And then when they conquered, either by force or by capitulation, he would take those 6,000 people and he would install them in the capital city to teach the people how to live and act like Romans who's listening. And when Jesus said he was going to build an, 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 an ecclesia, what they thought of were the publicans because the 6,000 members of the ecclesia, each individual, they were known as publicans. And Jesus said, I'm building something that we're going to invade culture. God has called you to be a publican. <laughs> God has called you to be a publican. God has called you to be a citizen soldier in His kingdom. And the four commitments that I'm calling you to today are part of the process that brings kingdom outcome and invades culture and confronts nations. And there is no middle ground. We've been committed to raising up a 6,000 member ecclesia for the sole purpose of birthing in our country an apostolic leadership moving in signs, miracles, and wonders that the church cannot ignore and the world cannot marginalize. You can't do that by committee. You can't do that through religious infrastructure. I'm not advocating the committees. I'm not advocating religious infrastructure. What I'm inviting you to do is to cast aside, to know that the commitment is yours to make and that you're going to go home and you're going to be this person from this day forward. Quit talking about. If we're not willing to do these things, not because I'm teaching on them, but because it's the clear testimony of Scripture, if we're not willing to do this, we need to shut our mouths and quit talking about revival because we're not willing to pay the price and we have no interest in anything other than what we've been experiencing. If you want what you've never had before, you must do what you've never done before. And what you do has to get down, right down where, where it, it affects your life in substantive, measurable, identifiable ways that you you are the center of, not that you're deferring over to a surrogate called a clergyman who's responsible to keep you feeling guilty about whether or not you're doing it. <laughs> so that you realize that you are the center of that universe and you are the leader, you are the king, you are the priest. God has called you and I'm inviting you, I'm imploring you, I'm begging you as a people that claim to love God with all your heart. This is the time. Now is the time. And if we're going to be a part of the outcome that's about to crest in the earth, we must be those who are going to opt in before it breaks ground and they put the sign on the door. We don't want to be like the ones that are the second ones in and we just keep
get wet. We want the real deal. We want to move into that which God has. And if that's you, I want you to stand up with me. Father God, I am delivered to your people, God. I have made my effort to wash their feet in apostolic truth. I have delivered to them the provocation and the mandate. And I ask in Jesus' name that you give them the grace by the Holy Ghost not to wait for further prompting, but go to the scriptures for themselves and say, I'm going to opt in to apostolic culture because I know that process leads to outcome and I'm tired of the status quo. I'm tired of waiting for some indefinable move of God that will never come. I want to be a part of what you're doing in the earth and I'm willing to be ground zero, not looking to anyone else, but realizing that it's Christ in me that's breaking out of our own lives and bursting into culture and confronting nations and it begins in the simplicity of the mandates that I've covered in the teaching tonight and in the last two services. Lord, I pray in the name of Jesus. Lord, man in pursuit of God is like a mouse in pursuit of a cat. It doesn't come to normal. I'm asking these people not to be normal anymore. <laughs> Father God said, no man comes to the Father but to draw him. Lord, they've done their part by coming here. I've done my part by delivering the word. Now I'm asking you to do your part by drawing them. You said in the scriptures that the psalmist cried out, draw me, I will run after you. God, if they don't run after you, I believe it's because you didn't draw them. And I'm calling you, Father God, to be faithful to your word. And to give this people a heart of obedience like David had. That they're willing to step into the overture of your process to receive the magnitude of the outcome that you're bringing into the earth. The great awakening that's right on the cusp of our society. And make ground zero to be us, almighty God, I pray. In Jesus' name. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. I'm in. I'm all in. How about yes. you guys? Yeah. Yeah.